Yes, so my research is on something called translation surfaces or flat surfaces. They are very simple objects. They are almost like child's games in some ways. In particular, maybe you played the computer game Pac-Man when you were a kid. So when Pac-Man goes off the right side of the screen, he comes on the left side. When he goes off the top, he comes on the bottom. So really, Pac-Man is happening. It's not really a square. It's the left and the right side are glued. So you have a tube, then the top and the bottom are glued. So you have what's called a torus or a donut. And what I study is generalizations of shapes like this. You can see one on the board behind me. This is something called the double pentagon, which is also related to something called the golden L. And you might ask, why do people study these things? One, because it's fun. Two, because it connects to many different areas of mathematics and even physics. Um, they're very simple questions in Newtonian mechanics, things called, systems called billiards that we don't know the answers to these questions. Even though we can kind of describe the physics, the long-term behavior of these systems is really quite complicated. Uh, so this is an area at the intersection of geometry, dynamical systems, what is maybe popularly known as chaos theory. So there's a lot of different connections you can make. And for me, what I love about this area is the fact that I get to make these connections. I get to learn every day something new when I'm, when I'm studying this. Math is something I'm very, very lucky. I grew up in a household that celebrated mathematics. My mother uh, is a physicist. My father is a retired mathematician and statistician. So around me, my older sister is a mathematician. Uh, all around me was mathematics. And I could see how much fun people were having doing it. And I think this is an opportunity that is really lucky as a child. And so one of the things I, I want to make sure is that everyone gets the opportunity to see the joy and the fun that mathematics has. It shouldn't, you shouldn't have to be lucky. For me, I was lucky because I would see. I would see people writing, scribbling on paper, people excited, people talking loudly, um, people being very quiet and thinking very hard. I got to see all these different parts and I got to see also traveling and going to different places and meeting people from around the world. So for me, it always was kind of a very romantic thing to do mathematics. So I, uh, every night before I would go to sleep, uh, one of my parents would come and read. Either my mom or my dad would tell me a story. And my dad, in particular, would love to talk. Uh, the story would often have a little mathematical puzzle or uh, just you know something to make me think. Um, and so this is one of my first memories, is just thinking about those questions uh, and play, again, getting that sense of play with mathematics. So from a young age, it's been something that it's been fun. Um, and so I think those earliest memories are probably lying in bed thinking about whatever story or whatever problem that my parents shared with me that day. I can actually, so this was before really doing research in substance. This was when I was a, a college student uh, and I was taking a class in number theory. Uh, and uh, usually the, the instructor had divided the problems into easier problems and harder problems. And one week, there was only one harder problem. And I had a roommate who was also in the same class. He's now a professor at Rutgers University. So we were both thinking hard about this problem. We were working. We couldn't, you know, it was, it was really hard. And I remember, at, you know, two in the morning, I was folding my clothes. I, had, I was like, OK, I give up. I'm going to go wash my clothes. And while I was folding my clothes, I realized, OK, this is how you do this problem. And this, like the sense, it was almost like a, you know, it's like an, a rush, uh, an adrenaline rush. And that was one of the moments where I was like, oh, this is fun. This is really, really fun. I can do this. It's not just a, it's, it's, it's something that really makes me happy at a level that's kind of different than almost anything else. And then you search for those moments. They don't happen very often. Um, but when they do happen, it's just amazing. I think the other thing I would say is it's maybe not a eureka moment, but is a, I remember waking up in, in, while I was in graduate school thinking about a math problem. And I was like, OK, I guess I'm becoming a mathematician if I wake up from sleeping thinking about the problem. This, this is actually a problem I uh, first started thinking about when I was here in Serum in 2003, many years ago. It was a problem about understanding how these surfaces that I talked about, these translation surfaces, how they change. If you stretch them and compress them, 
how they change and how they kind of, can you get kind of close to all possible other translation surfaces if you just do this very specific kind of changing. So there's a question, what we would say mathematically, on the dynamics of moduli spaces. And there's a question about, about mixing of, of these things. So I woke up thinking about it. I didn't end up solving it, but I woke up thinking about it. Yes, so I can, I would be very happy to. This was with my colleagues, David Olesino, and then David Olesino and Pat Hooper, and also my friend Anya Rondiker, uh, worked to help us figure out some of the origins of this problem. So there are five very famous kind of three-dimensional objects called the platonic solids. So in two dimensions, you probably learned in kindergarten about triangle and square and pentagon and hexagon. And very soon you realize, if you want a two-dimensional thing with all the sides being the same and all the corners being the same, there's infinitely many different ways to do it. You can have as many corners as you want, an n gone, so to speak, for any n. But if you go up a dimension and you want a surface where all the faces, like the facets of a jewel, are the same, all the edges are the same, and all the corners are the same, and the same in the sense that you can kind of go from anyone to anyone else, it turns out there's only five of these things. And many of them are very familiar to you, probably the tetrahedron uh, or the cube, of course. We've all played games with the cube, the dice. Uh, then there's the octahedron, the icosahedron, and the dodecahedron. And the dodecahedron is really, I think, it's a very beautiful shape. It looks somewhat like a soccer ball, but it's pentagons. It's made up of pentagons. And the question we asked or that we were thinking about was, what would it be like to move around on the surface of a dodecahedron? For example, imagine you started at one corner and you wanted to go on it. Let's say you lived in this corner. You had a house there. And you wanted to go for a run. In fact, I'm going to go for a run with some of my colleagues after this. So you want to go for a run, but you know you don't really want to say, see anyone else. And every, and every other uh, corner has a house on it. So you don't want to go and visit anyone else. You just want to go straight. You don't want to turn. It's early in the morning. You don't want to think. You want to just go straight and come back home. And the question is, can you do it? And it turns out on none of the other platonic solids can you do it. You either have to change direction at some point, or you have to stop by your neighbor's house and say hello. But on the dodecahedron, you can do it. And in fact, there's many different ways you can do it. And in fact, this shape behind me, this golden L or this double pentagon, played a crucial role. In some sense, it's a, you can say it's a cousin of the dodecahedron. There's pentagons involved. There's something called the golden ratio involved. Um, but we critically used the machinery of translation surfaces, of flat surfaces. And again, if you want a connection to CIRM, this is where many of us learned this machinery, and many of us met and have interacted. So this is in a very important place for this particular field. Uh, and we used pro computer programs that were developed by people here. Um, so it's, it's been, uh, it, it was really fun as a discovery because it linked something that feels very pure, Mathematically, very pure abstract geometry with computation, with very hands-on mathematics. And we've made videos about it, and we've made a website, and it's very fun, and it's very interactive. And hopefully, it gets people to see that there are still many questions about very basic things that we don't know the answer to, and that you can have a lot of joy in finding the answer. With Mariam, who of course we all miss very much, um, we worked on something together with Alex Eskin and Sasha Buffetto, who are both here at this meeting. We worked on a problem of counting what are called lattice points. And we worked with it where the lattice points represent actually themselves are surfaces. Um, they're particular kinds of surfaces. They're the orbit of something called the mapping class group. And this was something that brought together, one of the wonderful things about mathematics is getting the chance to collaborate and exchange ideas, and especially work with people who challenge you and who you have to work hard to keep up with. And this was the experience with not just with Mariam, of course with Mariam, but also with Sasha and of course with Alex. To get, get a chance to work together with these people is really inspiring because you're, it makes you be your best. Um, so we were doing a problem. The example problem is like counting points in a grid or counting points in a three-dimensional grid. But this was an example where the underlying space was in, in fact a space of surfaces or a moduli space. Absolutely. For, for me, as I said before, disseminating mathematics means sharing.
right? For me, it's, mathematics is a human activity. It's done by people. And getting a chance to share it, getting a chance to share that joy, that excitement is really, really important. And making sure, in particular, it's an issue of, of also of equality, uh, to make sure that people have access to mathematics. So when we try and disseminate it, when we try and explain ourselves, when we try and tell stories and share this, the end goal is to make sure that as many people as possible have the chance to access beautiful mathematics. Um, and I, had, I was very lucky. I had people around me sharing that joy. So for me, it's, it's not just, uh, it's something I very much enjoy, of course, but it's also almost a sense of obligation that I, I, I need to do this. Other people did it for me, so it's important that I continue to sort of pay it forward and share this. And in terms of the connections between mathematics and art, I think you know, math mathematics is a creative discipline in the end. We are creating new things out of patterns. We are creating new ideas. Um, and I found it very productive and exciting to talk to musicians or to talk to artists about what our processes are like. Maybe the end object we produce is not the same, but the process can be, it's not always the same, but it's similar and it's inspiring to talk. And so in particular, I should mention, I have a collaborator, Timi Atihanyi, who's an artist, a ceramicist, and a multimedia artist. And we've been teaching a course on mathematics and art together. And there's, in fact, a wonderful community, many of whom are in France and have been inspired by work at Serum. I, I won't mention, I, I, I'll mention some names. These are not, it's no, by no means exhaustive. Samuel Leliev, Alba Malaga Sabogal, uh, Olga Paris Romeskovich. There's some amazing people uh, and, and many others, the imaginary group who have explored these connections because I think these are important. They're, they allow people to grasp at least some of the joy and the creativity of mathematics, even if you don't know all the technical details. Just like you can go to a museum and appreciate a sculpture or a painting without knowing every detail about how it's painted, you can appreciate a piece of mathematics if people make an effort to, to, to share it in a way that's accessible. So I'll be working with Nicola Bederide, who will be the local, we'll be going to be working together on this project. So we have many uh, exciting projects as part of the Jean Morlet Chair, one of which is to explore the connections between mathematics, computation, and art. Uh, so creating imagery and creating, doing computational work uh, can often help inform mathematical discovery. So we had a semester a couple of years ago in Providence, this group of illustrating mathematicians, at ICERM, uh, which is a wonderful institute in Providence, where people who were doing computing, people who were doing illustration, people who were doing art all came together. And there we saw examples where a new illustration of an object led to new conjectures and new discoveries. So we want to try and do things like this with centering on ideas of geometry, these surfaces, billiards in two and three dimensions. Nicola is one of the world's experts in three-dimensional billiards and also something called circle packings, which is actually almost exactly what it sounds like. You try and pack as many circles, and you get beautiful and interesting images and beautiful and interesting mathematics, and the two can really inform and connect with each other. And together with Nicola and Pierre Arnoux and Olga, we are going to be organizing a conference, a workshop, where we bring mathematicians and artists together to try and collaborate and see what they can produce together.